Now in grade 10, you deal with igneous landforms, dike sills, and massive igneous rocks. And you will notice I called them bornhards and tors. Um, and many books refer to them as domes. This is actually incorrect. The dome refers to the whole body of massive igneous rock, not just the outcrop. Right. Moving on then to look at some images, and we're going to compare a vertical image with an orthophoto image. And you'll see at first glance they're quite similar. And what we're looking at here is a dike. This is the line along which a volcanic eruption took place many millions of years ago. And the net result is, this is mostly sedimentary rock in this area, but the net result is you have a hard layer. In fact, it's a vertical layer of igneous rock cutting straight across the landscape. We know it's vertical because it's not bothered by the slope of the land or anything like that. So in other words, it indicates that this is just a flat sheet of rock lying vertically across the landscape. That's on the orthophoto map. And notice that the scale of this thing, although we can see it quite clearly, it's not enough to cause the contours to bend in any way. If we look at the aerial photograph, you'll see that, in fact, somebody has been mining this, this feature, this dike, because there is a shadow of an edge. And that shadow indicates they've been digging it out. And all these roads here would indicate that they've been digging this dike out. And in fact, there's one, another one there you can see. And it's a smaller, narrower one. So you've got these dikes running across the landscape. And they stand out very, very clearly on photographs. And you just can't see them at all on the one in 50,000 map unless they're really big features. And if I refer you to the coffee bus and tear bus um, photographs and maps, which are featured in one of the other videos, on that map you can, in fact, see a large dike that does bend the contours because it's big enough. Whereas here, if these contours are five meters vertically apart, that means that this feature isn't sticking more than five meters above the landscape. So it doesn't cause the contours to bend. You can see we can, on the vertical aerial photograph, there's quite a lot more detail if you compare these trees there with those ones there. So the resolution of the vertical aerial photograph is better than the one in 10,000 also photo map. But the photograph, for instance, doesn't have any heights on it. And you can't actually see the slope on the photograph as it stands. So there is an example of a dike running across the landscape. Just to remind you, a dike will always be a straight feature because it's nearly vertical. If it was lying horizontal, we would call it a sill. And it would follow the contours. So let's have a look at what a sill looks like. Right, this is Harry Smith Mountain, which we are quite familiar with now. And if you look here carefully, you can see that Harry Smith Mountain, the top is made up of two distinctly different kinds of rock. This pale white rock here, and then this black dark rock on top. Now, the dark rock, you will also see, it's got a lot of vertical cracks in it. Let's have a look at how this landscape formed originally. You've got your steep cliffs. You've got that notch where the dike comes down. Another one over there, and right down to the other side. This, of course, is a Mesa, Harry Smith Mountain, or Plutberg at Harry Smith. And on top here, this horizontal layer of hard rock is a dolerite sill. And that extends right across. OK, so that's the situation now. Well, what was it like, say, 30 or 40 million years ago? Well, then what we had was layers of sedimentary rock covering all of this up. So there were layers of sedimentary rock. And in fact, this has been eroded away. So our sill used to be between layers of sedimentary rock. And then on top of all of this was the Trakensberg 
volcanics. Now if you go to the central berg today, you'll see there's about a thousand meter thickness of basalt that erupted out over an extended period 40 to 60 million years ago. So these are basalt, basalt being a volcanic rock. The soil is dolerite, exactly the same chemically as basalt, but it's a little bit coarser grained because it hasn't erupted at the surface. It's cooled down a bit slower, and so crystals have been able to form. Now, where did all this magma and lava come from? Well, it had to come from deep in the crust, and so there are feeder dikes coming through all of this. So one of our feeder dikes would have been that which we now see where there's a, a notch eroded there because basalt erodes quite easily, and these dikes would have come up through all the sedimentary layers and fed these huge volcanics. But you can imagine now, you've got a kilometer of rock up there, there's tremendous pressure as this liquid magma comes up and erupts at the surface, and it's going to, in some places, squeeze out between the sedimentary layers and so form our sill. And then likewise down here, the fact that there's a flat surface deep down, that would also indicate that the present erosion surface is underlain by one of these hard dolerite sills. And of course, in between, you've still got softer sedimentary rock. Now if we look at the edge of that sill, as you can see here in the 1 in 10,000 map, and you can see how the contours follow it. So that indicates that this is then a horizontal layer. And there is our dike again, cutting straight across the contours, whereas the edge of the sill, which is horizontal, which is the same, of course, the contours are all horizontal, um, so the contours follow the sill, but they cut, the dike cuts straight across the contours. So there is the dike, a vertical layer of igneous rock, and then all the way along here, We've got this layer of horizontal rock, and the contours follow it like that. So you can see where these features fit in. That that kink there is there. That one over there is there. And then the edge, the end of it is over there where it goes around the corner and in that direction. Okay, moving on to massive igneous rocks now. These are huge bodies of granite, and they are a lot harder to identify on a 1 in 50,000 map. So here's our 1 in 50,000 map, and you can see there's some nice smooth rounded hills, and the feature here that we would identify is that these slopes, as you go towards the top of the hill, starting off steep and flattening out. So from the bottom of the hill to there, we have got steep slope flattening out. So it's steep and then steep and flattens out. So that, of course, is a convex slope. And that is a feature of granite outcrops of massive igneous rocks. Now, I said earlier that these things look like domes. And that is actually an incorrect name, because they, the, this outcrop here is just a very tiny part of a granite outcrop, which covers, this particular one is near Nelspruit. It's about 100 kilometers in diameter. And so the whole big feature is the dome. But many school texts incorrectly refer to these as domes. And I'll allow you to continue to refer to them as domes because it's in all the textbooks. But the correct name is Bornhart. And the Bornhart there you can see in the diagonal aerial photograph is a convex, smooth, rocky outcrop. In the vertical aerial photograph, not so easy to see exactly what shape it is. So we can see that 
the 1 in 50,000 map tells us that the slopes are convex. Contours get wider apart as we go to the top. The vertical aerial photograph tells us that it's a rocky outcrop, but we've really got to go to an oblique photograph to get a true understanding of what this thing looks like. So notice we get information from all three sources, and we have to use them together if we're really going to understand what this thing looks like. So that is your massive igneous. The word massive means without structure. There are no layers in it, that sort of thing. It does not mean big, although massive igneous rocks generally are very big. Massive means without structure. Right, now also associated with massive igneous rocks are tors. And these pictures here are of the Lone Hill Tor in northern Johannesburg. Now a tor is also made of granite. But instead of being one smooth structure as a Bornhart would be, it's made up of a whole lot of boulders piled up on each other. Now we'll look at why that is the case um, when we look at it in grade 12, but for the moment we're just recognizing the features. On a 1 in 10,000 orthophoto map, we can see that there's not a lot of detail, and we would have to be really on the ball to realize that these are not trees, but each of these over here are boulders. And on the 1 in 50,000 map, we can hardly see it at all. There are two contours. There's a, one, a 20 meter, another 20 meter contour, which tells us that this thing's about 40 meters high. And as you can see, it's surrounded by houses. And there it is there. It is not a very big feature, but it is very much part of the granite landscape. And so in order to understand the tour properly, we pretty much have to go to the photograph. So if we just remind ourselves then, the Bornhart is like that. The tours are boulders piled up. They may be of similar size, but the tour is far less visible on aerial photography 